Welcome to the Apologetics Guy Show. It's the podcast that helps you find clear answers to tough questions about God, Jesus, and the Bible, and then helps you to better explain your faith with both courage and compassion. If we're just meeting, I'm Dr. Mikel Del Rosario. I'm your Apologetics Guy and the host of this podcast. I'm also a professor of Bible and theology here at the Moody Bible Institute, and I want to welcome you to my independent show. Really excited about our discussion today. Uh, today we have two guests in studio. We're talking about how to engage people in the abortion conversation with courage and compassion. And first guest here in studio is Dr. John Goodrich. John is a Bible professor, fellow Bible professor here on the Chicago campus at Moody Bible Institute, also a fellow graduate of Talbot, THM, yep. MDiv at Talbot, so we've got that Moody uh, Talbot connection. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Also, I should mention that John has written this wonderful book called Choose Life, and I really love the subtitle of this book. It is Answering Key Claims of Abortion Defenders with Compassion. So we are uh, kindred spirits in that regard, engaging with courage and compassion. Yeah. So yeah. thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. And second guest in the studio as well is Preeti Krishnamurthy. Yeah. She is a uh, sophomore, sophomore now, right? Yeah. Uh, so she actually came in with some some extra credits. She's a student here at the Moody Bible Institute, mm -hmm. and she is in the Bible department. Yeah. So thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, I should also mention that she is the president of Zoe, which is our pro-life organization on campus, our student club. So, so happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, when I first moved to Chicago, which was uh, fall 2022, so the summer of 22, 2022 when I moved here, something pretty amazing happened, which is that the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Mm. And that was just something that uh, so many people working in this space uh, Christians working in the pro-life movement uh, didn't think would happen in our lifetimes, and everyone prayed it would. Mm -hmm. But uh, now it's just a state's rights thing, since the Constitution in America doesn't um, allow the uh, the right to abortion as a constitutional right. And so I want to ask you just to start with you, Preeti, what is it like to be a young woman in what's now being called the post-Roe generation, um, doing the work that you do with Zoe? Yeah, I think that there is a lot of space for conversation about abortion there. It's um, it's debated a lot today, um, and there's a lot of conversation happening about it, um, especially after Roe being overturned. Um, there are a lot of different opinions and a lot of conversation around abortion. Um, but I think also in, in Christian settings, um, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of more awareness that needs to be raised on the issue of abortion. And I mean, even just moving onto campus last semester for me, um, something that was really weighing heavily was that we Moody is here and Moody Church is just down there and right in between is a Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. 10 minutes away. And it's it's we walk past it on our way to get yeah. groceries. We walk past it to go to, to you know places around the city. But we don't actually stop and think about the fact that day in and day out, every minute of the day, mm. um, life is being lost in that building. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though we are pro-life as Christians, um, I think that there is there's a lot more awareness to be realized. And, and we celebrate Roe being overturned. It's it's so, something to really rejoice over, but also to realize the fight isn't over. And there's still um, lives that are being lost to abortion every day. So I think there needs to be more conversation on um, abortion and, and pro-life work and how can we as Christians, who not everyone may be called directly to pro-life work in the same way that I am or other people are, but it is a command that we do stand up against these injustices. So how do we as Christians all um, not be apathetic on, on yeah. an issue like this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How have you seen attitudes change with this overturning of Roe versus Wade? Have you seen attitudes change at all in terms of your engagement on the street? I don't think um, specifically with Roe v. Wade, it's hard for me to say if if attitudes changed have been linked to, to Roe being changed or overturned. Um, but we have noticed, even just from last semester to this semester and just from the summer to now, just a shift in people's attitudes and mindset when discussing abortion. So people in the street that will often, um, usually they'll start with them wondering why they're, we're here or sometimes upset because we're standing there praying and giving out resources and it'll start a conversation and they'll say a comment or something and we'll try to engage in a conversation mm -hmm. with them. Um, and, and there are some that are more aggressive and there are some that are more open to talks. So it really it it's depends on day to day. Um, but I think what we've noticed just from last semester to this semester, um, something that's been heartbreaking is to see a shift in 
Um, in the past, I feel like abortion, the debate around abortion has been more around the personhood of the unborn. Mm -hmm. So people saying that it's a clump of cells, it's an embryo, but it's not living. Um, but lately, a lot of conversations we've had have been people are quick in the conversation to recognize that the, the unborn is a baby. Mm -hmm. um, and people are calling it a baby, even people that scream out on the street at us um, We'll, we'll call it a baby, but still um, try to justify mm. abortion and say that you can have your convictions on abortion or pro-life, but you can't push that onto someone else. I mean, so I think that we see, um, just being in a postmodern society, we see a lot of um, just that of like embracing relativism, and we see that in the conversation a lot on the street of you can have your truth, you can you can say abortion is wrong or that it's ending a life, but that doesn't affect me because mm -hmm. I can have my own opinion on it. So there's a the, just the as society gets further from embracing objective truth, we see that in our conversations on the street, I think, too, is, is in the past it's been a lot about it's, you know, trying to debate the science or establish the personhood of the unborn. But now sooner than later in a conversation, people are acknowledging it is a baby, it is a life, but, but a woman still has a right to end that life is what mm. people say. Mm. Well, John, some people want to say whatever's legal, that's a moral thing. If it's illegal, then it's an immoral thing. And what would you say to, to someone who kind of equated uh, the law with what was moral, because sometimes that's how people approach this conversation. Yeah, sure, and and I think there's there's a, there's an element of truth to that. All right, I think uh, uh, as as Christians, right, and I want to approach this conversation as somebody who who in fact does believe uh, that there is such a thing as as as, as biblical truth um, mm -hmm. and, and moral moral truth that's grounded in Scripture. Um, but I think even uh, even if we're talking with people who don't believe the Bible, I think it's, it's it's pretty easy to come to the conclusion that just because something is written in in law uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the final word on the subject, right? Um, I mean, all we have to do is is study the the history of our of our legislature or you know our our our, our, our laws in any given country and see that things. Uh, a change over time, which would suggest then that there are some imperfect laws mm -hmm. that are that are established um, in, in in each country. Um, on the one hand, the Bible does say we should obey our governing authorities, and at the same time, it says that we should obey God over man. Um, and so, uh, whatever laws have been decreed at any given time are subject to should be subject to scrutiny, and um, and we should be able to to recognize that they might be imperfect, and and mm -hmm. and, and we might need to, uh, you know basically discern um, through great, greater greater insight and certainly study of scripture as well that God might be calling us to in fact a higher calling than mm -hmm. simply just to obey what the what the law of the land would say um, and so I mean just again look at look at the the history of our country as it concerns uh, slavery or or um, you know um, racial, racial segregation mm -hmm. it wasn't that long ago when some of those things were legal in this country yeah mm -hmm. and uh, the consensus today would recognize that those are those are immoral things to to do and so um, I think that uh, it's pretty clear, just uh, basic basic study of sociology, but um, even much more study of scripture, that we're called to uh, to be thinking people and to make moral decisions beyond just what the law says. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, with this kind of culture says relativism or society says relativism, there'd be no way to have reformers in society, right? In fact, if you're the one who says, these laws are unjust, we need to change these laws, mm -hmm. well, then guess what? You're the immoral one because right. you're the one saying... Uh, we should change these things, but some things demonstrably, like you just mentioned, segregation and um, slavery, things like this, uh, it's not like slavery became wrong and then we changed the law. No, it was always wrong, you right, know, right, <laughs> even right. when the law allowed for such things. Well, how do you make uh, the natural law argument hmm. against abortion? Because some people will say, well, you could quote some Bible verses at me, but I don't mm -hmm. believe the Bible. Yeah. And so for some people, perhaps the natural law argument is if is an invitation to consider the Christian way to view this right. issue. But before getting to the Bible, how might you make that natural law argument? In some ways, the natural law argument is our is our best ammunition. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think there's some just basic premises that we can recognize that will help us uh, to, to demonstrate that, uh, that, that, uh, that abortion is immoral. And so um, I'm just going to read from my notes a little bit here because I've written some of this stuff down, but uh, and I'm just borrowing some of these arguments from other experts who have, who have made this case uh, even before me. But uh, the first premise we need to recognize is that uh, from the moment of conception, um, an unborn entity is a full-fledged member of the human species, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's uh, an, an argument that needs to be demonstrated, but if we can, if we can demonstrate that premise, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a very important first step. Um, and secondarily, um, we, can, we, we, need to, we need to argue that it is immoral uh, to, to kill a member of the human species. And uh, I think, thankfully, we're in a, in a place in our society where that's 
basically the consensus viewpoint, right? That murder is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so if those two premises um, hold true, then I think it, it makes sense to argue or to conclude in any way that, that, that killing um, and, and, and unborn, um, an unborn entity is, is, is in fact more murder and, and, and therefore immoral. And so, and really what it comes down to is establishing that first premise. So that's really where the debate is. And, uh, but thankfully we also live in, in a day and age where uh, the life sciences actually are showing us uh, more clearly than ever that, uh, that life begins at conception and that the consensus, even in the life science community, as, as, as recent University of Chicago PhD thesis has argued, the consensus viewpoint is that, uh, that life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. And having established that, that biological fact, I think we can then deduce that, that killing an unborn child is in fact wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, the core of the pro-life argument comes down to this one question, what is the unborn? Is the unborn human? Yeah. Because if the unborn is not human, if the answer is no, then you could, I mean, for any reason whatsoever, um, it, you don't really seem to need much justification for killing something that's, that's you know, like, uh, you know, extracting a tooth or something like that. Versus if it is an unborn human person, then no justification seems adequate hmm. to um, take the life of an innocent human person. But whether it's right or, or not, has to it depends on what that thing is, mm. mm -hmm. right? Now, Preeti, you've talked to people not only outside these abortion clinics, but actually the workers there. Mm -hmm. And how do the workers see what they're doing? Are they the ones who say it's just a clump of cells, or do they say it's a baby but it's not a person? How do they see what they're doing? Right. So we go out about three times a week and Saturdays are usually the days where we engage with workers because um, Saturdays are some of their busiest days. So they have usually two or three workers that stand right in front of the door and try to um, remind us of the bubble zone. So to stay eight feet away or to try to block us when we talk to women. Um, but it's also a really good opportunity, even though Saturdays are very draining and, and hard for, in a lot of ways. It's also a really good opportunity to try to reach the workers, which is why this semester, one of the things I wanted to do was to include Saturdays in our schedule because last week we were only doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, so that we can reach the workers as well because they also need to be reached with the gospel and with the truth about life. Um, and so we've noticed different responses from the workers. We um, There's one particular worker we've talked to a lot this semester, and she um, she would say similarly that it's not a life. So mm -hmm. one of the things that she had, and we had seen her every Saturday, and it was interesting, the first Saturday we were there, she didn't even want to talk to us, just quiet, hearing what we have to say, but not engaging. And the second Saturday, she started talking to us a little more. Mm. And the third Saturday, she she was a lot more open in, in talking. And I, and I hope part of that is also to her, for her to see our approach, that we're not being aggressive, we're being compassionate. And um, we are there, we tell them we are there also too, because we care about them and we want them um, to not have to live with the guilt of working in a place like this. Um, um, but one of the things that she had said was that, you know, um, it isn't, it isn't, a, it's not murder because it's not a baby. It's not born yet. Um, and so the, it's a clump of cells is, is something that would resonate with her kind of reasoning. And so we mm -hmm. tried to talk about fetal development and how, um, from the moment of conception, as you were saying, Dr. Goodrich, that, um, the a baby's, um, eye color, hair color, ethnicity, and gender are already determined at that very moment. And even just, um, the baby has a unique chromosomal structure and things like that. So we actually have pamphlets that show fetal development all throughout um, and little baby models also that show mm -hmm. it. So we tried to engage with her in that way. Um, and then we also have resources for her on why you should leave um, Planned Parenthood. But we also have workers, um, one particular worker just two weeks ago, who um, she was almost the opposite of that, what I was saying earlier of she had, re she had started the conversation with us. She asked, how long have you been coming out here and, and protesting or praying? And and then we started talking to her, and she recognized right away. She said that it is ending life, mm -hmm. um, but that that's okay. And she said murder mm -hmm. happens, and she she actually said those words. She said wow. murder happens, and Christians need to stop being worried about things that they can't control. She's like, it's mm. going to happen. Um, and so trying to, and that the, that conversation was very heavy in a lot of ways. She 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 really was um, acknowledging, like it was at that point, I was like, so you acknowledge that abortion is murder, it is ending life. And she said, yeah, but it's not wrong. It happens in some situations, it's necessary. And so that, those are two different views. You can see two different workers. One worker, she was saying, this is not a baby, this is not ending life. And this, the other worker, she's recognizing that it is ending life. Mm. And that was the first time I've ever seen someone that openly calling wow it you know yeah. um, after saying it is murder but it's okay in certain circumstances um, so we see different perspectives from workers um, often Preeti you know I really like what you're sharing because one you're not just talking at these people you're actually wanting to hear their views 
and you've asked them enough questions to find out that, hey, people have different views, even if they both work at Planned Parenthood, and asking them to understand, seeking to understand, not just so that you can uh, refute them or uh, just talk at them, but actually trying to understand where they're coming from. I think that's, that's the first thing that people should do in terms of engaging with courage and compassion is to ask those questions. You know, what do you mean by it's, it's a baby or it's not a baby or it's a clump of cells, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. um, ask them a clarifying question mm-hmm. and then uh, try to find out where, where they got that idea. You know, Absolutely. I want to want to read you something. Once you get uh, get your thoughts on this, this is part of the language from the 2022 Supreme Court decision, and I want to make this observation after reading it. It says, "A person shall not intentionally or knowingly perform or induce an abortion of an unborn human being if the probable gestational age of the unborn human being has been determined to be greater than 15 weeks." This language seems to agree that the unborn is a human being, hmm. even in the law. But John, many people have this, this philosophical objection that the unborn, uh, they're human beings, but they're not human persons. So right. we mentioned that earlier. How do you engage with that kind of thinking? Yeah. You know, it's, a, it, it's an interesting kind of argument because uh, the distinction between what is human, what is a person, um, is, is a, a, rather, a rather recent invention. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and it's really based on a very arbitrary decision. I mean, at what point then are we going to say that if it's not uh, at the moment of conception, um, at what point are we going to say then that uh, a, a baby becomes a person? You know, um, is it on the basis of size or uh, gestational age or function or intelligence, um, uh, the ability to consent? I mean, these are all very arbitrary decisions that mm-hmm. we have to make, and they're certainly not going to be decided on the basis of, of, of science or some sort of other um, empirical data. And so uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a curious argument, and I think it's very problematic. And as soon as we start assigning personhood to any of these very arbitrary um, markers, um, a variety of other ethical um, um, problems present themselves. You know, I'll, I'll suddenly, uh, you know, the elderly who um, who, who perhaps uh, no longer have uh, the, the ability to function, right, mm-hmm. like they like they once did, or somebody who's in a coma, mm-hmm. right, um, suddenly they become subject to the decision of whether or not they're they're in fact a person on the basis of their their loss of certain functions or or, or thinking ability or what have you. So, um, I think it's a dangerous argument to make, and ultimately it breaks down. Yeah, yeah. So what's the difference between you and me and, and, and us and, and people who are unborn? One is size. Are people less valuable because they're smaller or bigger? Uh, we're a lot bigger now than when we were born, right? Uh, we're still the same person, yeah. actually. Uh, level of development. Some you know people are older, some people are younger. We're not going to say that people who are older or younger are less valuable. Or like you said, consciousness. If you're in a coma, does that mean you're less of a person, right? level of development or environment because someone's in the womb, it doesn't make them less of a person. I used to teach uh, a class at University of Phoenix, and it was a research class. And one thing I asked them to do was choose a controversial issue, and I put abortion as one of them. (laughs) And actually, I put partial birth abortion as one of them. And I said, uh, write your view, and then in order to write a good paper, I want you to find the best argument against your view. Mm and then cite it from a primary source and then write why you think there's something wrong with that. Yeah. And so I strategically put partial birth abortion on there because it's just so obviously gruesome mm-hmm. that anybody looking at what that actually is should be, should be repulsed, right? Mm-hmm. And people change their view over it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have to do any preaching or anything. I just said, just look at what it actually is. Right. And, then, uh, and so people actually changed their view on Mm -hmm. at least on partial birth abortion and then began to say, uh, you know, maybe these other kinds of abortion are are wrong, too. Uh, In fact, one student wasn't even a Christian, but he was really upset at um, some people at an abortion clinic that was telling him that he and his wife should abort because the baby was going to have Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And when his baby was born, um, his baby didn't have Down syndrome. (laughs) And I think he actually did, but it was like virtually undetected. Right. Now, even if he did have an advanced case of Down syndrome, that wouldn't make a, abortion a, a valid moral choice. Right. But he was so angry at the fact that they, they almost told him, I mean, they were telling him to, to abort his own child. Right. And um, yeah, so that, that really hit home for him that he wasn't even a Christian. But um, I think people can see that the Christian 
view on this actually uh, resonates with with what we feel welling up inside of us when we see what this actually is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, Preetha, you sometimes get to talk to people at these clinics who um, say this is just health care and it's about women's rights. Tell us a story about how you've engaged with that kind of conversation on the street. Right. Yeah. There's many women that we talk to going in and out of the clinic and also just people on the street um, that talk to us. Um, and when it comes to the argument of um, women's health care or that, you know, it's my body, my choice, mm-hmm. uh, we definitely hear that one a lot, um, more so from people on the street than women going in and out. Um, women going in and out usually are, 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 some of them are in pain or they're there for a specific reason. And most of the time they're talking to us about, about their unplanned pregnancy and their mm-hmm. circumstances. But it's people on the street normally that bring up the my body, my choice, that, that kind of um, those kind of arguments. Um, and there was one woman that we had spoken to earlier this semester who had come, came up to us and she just screamed, um, you don't have the law or science on your side. Um, and then so we had, she had, and I said, do you have a few minutes to talk? And so she came up to us and she was very angry just getting into the conversation as well. So it was pretty circular in how we were going over the same things over and over. But in the discussion, she was saying um, that, she, yes, she, her main focus was just that abortion, it, according to the law, is not wrong. And that it's not a baby, according to science. Um, and that you don't have a right to say what I should do with my body because of your religious convictions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we try, I tried to explain both sides of that to her, that indirectly, in some ways, we do have the law on our side. And I was trying to say that even though there are laws that um, l- our legal system right now doesn't recognize life beginning at conception, um, if, you, if, if someone were to kill a pregnant woman, they are charged with double homicide. Mm-hmm. And so indirectly, our laws are recognizing that the unborn is a distinct yeah. living whole human being, but not doing anything with that in terms of constitution or um, outlawing abortion. Um, and then when it came to science, we showed her fetal development and kind of explained what I had said similar about, um, you know, from the moment of conception, all these factors are already determined for you and showed her just in eight weeks how developed an unborn baby is. Um, but she kept kind of saying the same thing of just because you believe this doesn't mean I have to believe this. And so It wasn't really going anywhere in terms of she didn't want to continue engaging with the information we were giving her or trying to reason through it. But she just kept saying that it's wrong for us to try to tell someone who is in a situation where they're uh, facing an unplanned pregnancy that they have to carry this this she wouldn't call it a baby, I guess, Mm. whatever she would call it. Um, But it is a baby, we know, to term because of their own circumstances. And so what we're trying to really um, push in that or or discuss in that discussion, not push, is um, that no matter how we're debating abortion, we have to keep bringing it back to the personhood of the unborn, Mm -hmm. right? Because there are difficult circumstances. Um, I've worked at a pro-life pregnancy center for a couple of years before coming to Moody and we know that women come in with some really difficult situations that lead them to wanting to consider abortion. But there's also a lot of women that are choosing abortion just for convenience. So there's both sides of it. But the moment you establish, as you were saying earlier, the personhood of the unborn, then all those circumstances and those arguments around kind of fall apart because this is a distinct living human being, then it, this baby has a right to live. Mm-hmm. Um, and no other circumstances around. We can grieve the circumstances around this pregnancy mm-hmm. and we can try to support them in choosing life, but not undermine the value and the right of this baby's life to live. Yeah, yeah. This my body, my choice is another thing we, we hear often. And how, how do you counsel people to engage with that kind of thinking? Yeah, I think it's, it's yeah, I don't want to minimize the emotion involved in it because, of course, we want to be, all be very protective of, our, of ourselves and, and, mm-hmm. and, and, we, and we behave that way on a regular basis. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's a variety of factors which would su- suggest to us that uh, just because, you know, we... we have our own bodies doesn't necessarily mean we have, uh, you know, as it were, sovereignty over ourselves um, in in the way that I think the the general public today would like to suggest. I mean, uh, at, at at the very least, uh, I think we can recognize that si- scientifically speaking, um, you know, the uh, the baby within the womb of a mother is intricately tied in with uh, the, the the health of the mother, and um, and there, I mean, there's even like DNA as far as I'm aware, anyway, passing you know mm-hmm. between uh, you know the mother and and the, and the child. Uh, there's healthcare professionals who are involved in an abortion. So obviously there's other bodies mm. involved in, in an abortion, um, in the practice of abortion. Uh, and then, you know, just from a Christian perspective, and I think this is important that we, we say these kinds of things to Christians who, you know, say they, they believe the gospel and they want to um, submit their, their own lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, is that we, our bodies are not our own. We were bought with a price, according mm. to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians mm-hmm. chapter 6. Mm-hmm. Um, we're called to lay down our rights for, for one another. And so I think the gospel message itself has practical implications for just recognizing the limitations of this rhetoric of, 
of my body, my choice. Yeah. I mean, I think we can agree with people that on one hand, it's part of her body in the sense that it's inside her body, if that's what they mean. That's mm -hmm. why it's important to ask, what do you mean by that? Yeah. You know, and sure. So it's inside her body and I can see where you, where you might say it's, it's her body. But if the baby does have different DNA, yeah. it's actually in not her body, mm -hmm. even though it's inside her body. Right. And so to help people make that distinction sometimes is, is helpful. And, uh, you know, in so many other uh, moral situations, people will say, well, if it's not hurting anybody, you know, you can do whatever you want, right? But um, in this case, actually, it is hurting somebody. Absolutely. And it, in, in, a, in a very uh, um, graphically gruesome kind of way. Interestingly, this whole discussion has come up again in the public square on a, on a popular level because Britney Spears came out with a memoir, a new memoir, and I saw this People magazine uh, headline that says uh, that basically she, she talks about this painful experience yeah. because um, she, she had an abortion because Justin Timberlake didn't want to be a dad. And so this has come back into the public uh, discussion in terms of um, the, the emotional toll that this takes on women. Uh, Preeti, have you talked to any women who've explained the emotional dimension of, of all of this, of having an abortion? Yeah, so a lot of times, actually, this semester, we've seen a lot of, of situations similar to this, of women who have come out of the clinic just having had an abortion. Mm. Um, and so although they may not always explain the extent of the emotional dimension since it's just happened, um, when we engage with them, it's not like they're coming for post-abortion support, like at the pregnancy center that I would work at in my hometown. Um, but we can see physically even just a couple of them. I'm trying to, This one woman that we had talked to two weeks ago, um, she had come out and she was like physically in pain and mm. so when I'd asked can I talk to you for a moment she said I just had an abortion I can't stand mm. and she was saying she was in pain and so I walked with her to her car and gave her a resource um, what we do have post-abortion resources that we give to connect them with centers to get post-abortion support like Christian centers that can help them um, but whenever we're engaging in conversations with women who just have had an abortion um, surgical abortion is usually the one that they say they just had um, we just the first thing I will do is say can I pray with you mm. um, because there's at this point a, a life has been lost but also this woman is she's going to have to live with the guilt of that for so long. And you can see the emotional impact of it even just immediately on them in how some of them will tear up as I'm praying, that they will say, yeah, my baby is gone. Like things like that have been said. And just the physical pain as well is something that we can't diminish is that these, like they're having a hard time walking and they often come out with a, a ginger ale or a can of soda that they give them after the, the abortion. Um, and so we, when, as, we, as we pray, we share the gospel with them and we give them resources. And, and I always offer my number if they need anything um, and things like that as well. But we do, although we haven't heard someone say, you know, I regret this, um, we can see it on their face as they're tearing up and they're saying, yeah, my baby's life is gone. Um, even recently, we've talked to some men who've come out with their partner who um, had an abortion. And there was one man earlier this semester, I think it was this right as we started, maybe the second or third week, who was tearing up because he wanted the child. Mm -hmm. And he said, I wanted this baby, but it's not my place to say. Hmm. Um, and so just even how we as a society have diminished um, a man's role in being able to speak up and recognize that it's just as much his child as it is hers. And that was heartbreaking to see as, as he was really emotionally regretting being there. But he said, I have to support her. And, and, he, and his partner had had an abortion. So we see a different range of emotions, but we never see someone come out of there happy and joyful after just having had an abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I really like the what's coming out of our, our conversation here is that this is not an, uh, only an issue-centered debate. This is a, a personal conversation that you have with people. Absolutely. And, and you under, you're trying to understand where they're coming from. You're trying to minister to them mm -hmm. and see this as a ministry and not uh, just trying to score debate points with people, right? Because Absolutely. this is a ministry. Um, how do you respond to people who say abortion is good for women after all you've seen? I mean, people say that abortion is good for women. Right. Um, it's not good for women. It's not good for anyone involved. And I think that when people say that, and oftentimes we also hear, um, you know, ab making abortion illegal will um, create spaces for unsafe back alley abortions. And you hear that aspect of it. Women need access to safe abortions. Mm. I mean, so again, going back to the personhood of the unborn, if this is a baby, um, 
encouraging someone to end their baby's life can never be good for them, you know? Um, and, and there's no such thing as a safe abortion if it's ending the life of a baby. But we even know, and there are statistics that prove this, of, of the trauma and the emotional impact of having an abortion on a woman for years after she has an abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's why women seek post-abortion counseling. Um, having worked at a pregnancy center, we know that women will come in years later wanting post-abortion counseling to overcome abortions they've had in the past or things like that, um, post-abortion support, because it's not something you just get over, um, which is why even Zoe, our student group, our focus is always the gospel, because we can go out and, and have our focus to be saving babies, but at the end of the day, what's the point if they don't come to know the Lord, the only one who can bring hope and forgiveness and healing for them? So these women, too, that come out and have an abortion, there's no um, counseling service or program that I can refer to them to that will help them at this point they've ended their baby's life and they need the gospel so even just recognizing that it isn't good for women it isn't good for the baby um but oftentimes we think um, it's solved an immediate problem of maybe mm-hmm. they're seeing their baby as a problem um, and, and that's, you know, around their circumstances right now and they need to get rid of their problem now. But they've created a bigger problem for themselves now, mm-hmm. um, not just emotionally, but with their, their own conscience for one. They've ended their baby's life, but even just the emotional aspect of it and, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about all of the, the heartbreaking stories that surround um, people who feel like there is a need for abortion. And it's not that, for example, in cases of, of rape, it's not that uh, th- that case makes abortion right to us. Our hearts break because rape is so wrong. Absolutely, yeah. So how do you marry courage and compassion when you are training your people to go out so that uh, we're approaching this as, as ambassadors of Jesus? What do you do to, to equip your people? Mm -hmm. We make sure that we pray a lot before we go out all the time. And I think one thing that I continue to remind myself um, every time I go out is just um, remembering to speak the truth, but in love. So whatever we do, if it's not done in love, there's no point, right? And so even as we stand there, um, we have to stand there in humility and remind ourselves the only reason that you know, I'm not working in Planned Parenthood or I'm not or that I've never had an abortion is by the grace of God, um, that he's opened my eyes to know him. And in the same way, we have to pray that for and and, and try to hope that each and every one of those workers and, and the women that go in and out experience that same grace. So to recognize that if we go out there in pride and recognizing that I would never have an abortion, I would never work at Planned Parenthood, then yes, we are going to be aggressive and we are going to just see this as a, a political issue to debate and not that these are people's lives at stake. Mm-hmm. This is an actual baby's life and a woman who's going in and, and is going to be affected by the fact that she's ending her baby's life. And so to really um, recognize just the complexity of, of how much this is going to affect one life being lost, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's the guilt is now on the woman and the worker and her partner. Um, so I think the, the best way for us to remember to, you know, match courage and compassion together is, is humility, is to remember that the only reason we're not, um, we're even, we're recognizing this is wrong and we're not doing worse than them is, is by the grace of God. Mm-hmm. So remembering that in, in how we talk to them and also remembering that no one is too far gone to come to know the Lord. So these workers um, and um, these women we're hoping as they see us out there day in and day out that they will wonder what is making these students want to come out here and do this day after day. And we hope that that our actions and the way that we speak points them to the Lord and that they see they want to know who this God is that we serve, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John, how do you train your students to engage with courage and compassion in this area? It's not just this area, right? And when I when I'm when I'm teaching my students, it's about how to how to represent Jesus um, in an, uh, an authentically Christian way, biblical way, and in all aspects of their life, which is to stand up for the truth and to, as Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter ten, you know, to to uh, take every thought captive, right? Mm. In other words, to to engage the minds um, and uh, the spiritual warfare that's going on in our world, mm-hmm. but to do so in a way. Um, you know, not not with uh, and, you know enacting violence on other people, but to engage them in, in their in their thinking, mm-hmm. and uh, to to encourage them to prepare um, um, the right the right arguments. Not because they want to win an argument, but because they're uh, because uh, reason um, and revelation together, right, can have a huge impact on on the people that they are they are they are engaging with. So, um, and so yeah, it's to is encourage people to be just like Jesus, who is going to encounter people um, and engaging their thoughts. Um, but also to to do so in a way that 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 follows in examples of, of, of Jesus and, and and offering love and compassion, and to uh, um, you know to be to be bold and courageous and yet to do so 
um, in, a, in a way we'll, that, that, that shows that we love the individuals that we're, we're speaking to. Mm-hmm. And it's not just a debate to win. Yeah. Right. I love how you mentioned humility so much in, yeah. in this book yeah. and that, you know, we all have the same core need before God for forgiveness. It might be in different areas of our lives. But when we just consider how much God has, how much grace God has given to us, mm-hmm. uh, that we can extend that, that grace and compassion to others as well as God was patient with us. Yeah. And so thanks for bringing up those scriptures. Um, I really love the uh, Ephesians 4 about mm-hmm. speaking the truth in love and Ephesians 6 about this, this spiritual battle that we don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our, the people we're talking to, they're not the enemy, mm-hmm. right? right. These are people actually who God loves dearly and who actually have been uh, taken captive by these, these deceptive ideas and, and deceptive spirits they don't even know are there. Mm-hmm. Um, Preeti, you mentioned there's actually a couple of Bible verses that are the theme verses for, for Zoe, right? For Zoe. What are those? Right, yeah. So I can read um, from Psalm 139 is actually our verses that we were founded on um, okay. and that we, anytime we have an event for Zoe or even when we meet with our leadership, we read this, um, which is just verses 13 to 16. Um, for you form my inward parts. Uh, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, even as yet there were none of them. And then another verse, that's what we were founded on, and that's what we have on all of our Zoe um, posters and everything. But another verse that just I always go back to and has really encouraged me, even on the days where sometimes you don't feel like doing this ministry because it's draining and you remind yourself, um, is Proverbs 24, 11, rescue those who are being taken away to death, um, mm-hmm. hold back those who are being taken to the slaughter. Um, and that verse is always on my mind because it's not an option. It's a command. It's not Mm -hmm. the Lord suggesting that we do that, but it's a command for every Christian to stand up for um, those who can't stand up for themselves. And so that's our Zoe, our slogan is a voice for the voiceless. um, And that's what we try to do is, is to stand up for those who, whose voice has been taken away from them. Hmm. So you mentioned earlier that not every Christian is called to do exactly what you're doing, but what are some different ways that people can get involved in supporting uh, this kind of work? Right. So not everyone is called directly to, you know, work at pregnancy centers or this do this kind of ministry, but we're all called to pray. Um, so I think, um, I don't know how many Christians actually pray every day for the end of abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, so just being faithful and praying daily um, for the end of abortion, also praying for pro-life organizations and praying for protection for them and support. Um, and also if uh, financial support is something that Christians um, need to do is if, if the Lord has placed it on their heart to do so and they are able to, is to support and fund pro-life organizations because all of them run completely from funding from churches and and, um, other Christians who are concerned about the issue of abortion. Um, And so I know from experience of working in a nonprofit that all of our funding does come from churches. And so we need Christians to be generous in their giving as well. Um, But prayer is is the most important thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, you have any suggestions for how people can get involved in something like this? Yeah, I think I think it's good. I, th- I think people who will get involved when they feel equipped to get involved, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. so I think um, equ- equipping is going to require a variety of different things for a variety of different people. But I think uh, you know, reading, studying, um, being aware of the arguments that they're going to encounter as they have conversations with with folks um, um, will give Christians confidence in order to mm-hmm. con- to actually have those difficult conversations. Um, again, these are not arguments to be to be won just to win a debate. These are these are there are lives at stake. Um, but uh, but if we don't have the confidence to actually engage in the conversation, then 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 the battle's already lost, right? And so I think uh, picking up a, a book and or or watching a YouTube video that will train somebody um, to to counter the pretty flimsy arguments, right, mm-hmm. uh, for the uh, pro-abortion um, um, side is is is, 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 a, is an easy thing that we can do in order to you know prepare ourselves for the battle. Yeah. Mm. Well, you can check this book out if you're watching this video or listening to the podcast, Choose Life by John Goodrich and Jeanette Pfeiffer. And uh, is there anything else you want to say as we land the plane here, Preeti? No, I think we covered a lot of it. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to speak on this. Yeah, you're welcome. And thanks, John, for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your work with Zoe. It's, it's so encouraging to hear what you guys are doing. Thank you. It's encouraging, too. And I've uh, it, it, we've been with your book and your work as well. Thanks. Mm. And we thank you so much for joining us and watching and being a part of this podcast here on the Apologetics Guy Show. If you did appreciate this episode, I'd love it if you would leave an 
a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or if you're watching the YouTube video to drop a comment and let us know what you think about this issue in our conversation. I'd love to engage with you in the comments. I'm your apologetics guy, Dr. Mikel Del Rosario, and until next time, keep the faith. 